Good morning. I want to invite you to join us as we read from the book of 1 Corinthians this morning. Today's passage is 1 Corinthians 6. I'll read the passage and then finish by saying, This is the word of the Lord, and you can respond by saying, Thanks be to God. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, as a father, I'm constantly telling my kids what not to do, just like Paul is constantly telling the Corinthian church what not to do. But when I'm teaching my kids not to do certain things, I'm also constantly stopping to educate them on why I give them a rule, right? So my, my daughter, Lucy, my oldest, she's, she's pretty circumspect. She, she's conscientious. She, if she does something wrong, it's probably intentional, uh, but for my son, Calvin, he's a little more spacey, right? He's a little more unaware. And so when he'll get out of the car sometimes, he'll just kind of start running, right? Just like running around. And so I'll tell him, no, Calvin, when you get out, you got to stop. you got to stay where you are. And, but then I have to tell him, explain to him, right? Calvin, if you run into a parking lot, if you just run out there, there might be a car, right? Because we're in a parking lot. And then you get smashed. You get flattened, you know? And I say, I'd... I say, I don't want a Calvin pancake. I like Calvin the way he is, right? And then he laughs. But I, I'm hoping by just giving the simple instruction that he will learn the dangers of doing something like that. So I don't just say no. I also say why I teach so that hopefully when he's 30 years old, he won't still be running out of the car into parking lots. If he, if he was, he wouldn't have made it to 30 years old, right? So Paul, in a very basic way, Paul operates in the same way. This is, not, this is not complicated, but Paul gives us commands, and then he instructs us as to why he gives the commands. He gives us a reason for it. This is, this is basic, it maybe shouldn't be said, but a lot of people read the Bible as if it is simply a book full of rules, and they miss that God, through sometimes teaching rules to us, is actually informing us about something life-transforming. He's saying no to certain things, he's saying yes to certain things, but he's also giving us the reason why, which illuminates for us exactly who we are. Now, the key command in this passage in 1 Corinthians 6 is very clear. The command is don't file a lawsuit against someone who's a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. So if you're a Christian, don't be suing other Christians for small things, or at least don't use secular means to settle some sort of civil suit between Christians. And we live in a highly litigious society, so lawsuits are very common, so this is important for us. But he doesn't just give that command. He goes on from that command to set himself up for the theology in this passage, the the why behind the command. And the theology here is going to broaden our view of the church. It's going to emphasize this incredible distinction there is between the church and the world. It's going to show you, if you're a believer in Jesus, why you have such an incredibly high calling. So a simple command, a command that maybe will never apply to you. Maybe you'll never want to sue someone in your life. But the theology, the why behind it, will change everything about how you see yourself and how you see God. Now, just a side note, one of the most talked about verses in this passage is one I'm not going to deal with today, 
because I want to wait till next week and spend more time on it. Right? And that's verse 9. You may have noticed that as it was being read, it talks about homosexuality. And that's such an important little phrase at the end of verse 9 that it, it really, I think, demands some more time for us to, to think on it and to just bring out the meaning of that passage. I see a lot of you know, videos or people, you know, influencers on social media that will talk about this passage and give it a to- totally wrong interpretation of what it says. And so I, I think there's incredible clarity in Scripture on this topic. And so next week we're going to talk about the gospel for the LGBT community. And I think that will be an incredibly helpful sermon for you as that's a, such a misunderstood topic in our day. But just as a preview for that, the, the Bible and the Christian faith gives the greatest answer for people who are in that community. You would identify in that community, you have the greatest hope, the greatest gift, the greatest truth is given to you in Scripture. So I hope you'll join us next week for that. But today I want to talk about just the main thrust of this passage. Now, last, last couple of weeks we've been in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, and we've been seeing a situation that Paul is dealing with that involves this really terrible sexual sin, where a, a man is having a relationship, a sexual relationship with his stepmother. And so we saw that this was something forbidden in the Old Testament, and it's something that even the Gentiles, even in a place like Corinth, which was very uh, progressive sexually, shall we say, very free sexually, even they would not do this. And so Paul says the answer to this kind of open, unrepentant, unchanged sin is excommunication. It's to remove that person from the membership of the church. And we talked about this, this topic, when is this necessary? When is it necessary to actually remove somebody from the church? And we saw that specifically needed in issues of sin that can cause division or that harm the witness of the church, and specifically with sins that people don't want to receive help on and they don't want to change. And so this is a, a, something very serious, but in continual unrepentant and these kinds of uh, very serious sins, there is a time where you have to say somebody is not part of the church. And the idea here is not that we cast out every person who struggles with sin because this would be a very empty building. Uh, it's not that we, that we take those who are less mature and who are struggling and trying to grow and we say, you're not doing good enough, you're out. No, of course not. The, the Christian faith is all about helping those who are wanting and desiring to turn from their sin. So that's not the idea at all. Rather, that there are certain cases where a person is simply unwilling to accept help and unwilling to change. And so there has to be sometimes a line drawn for Christians in order to protect the witness of the church and to protect that individual, to push them in their life, to, to get out of their complacency and to see the seriousness of the situation they're in. And then we saw at the end of chapter 5 that there's even a time where we're supposed to judge. Paul uses that word, and it's very strange for us, but he says, you don't judge those outside the church, but you do have to judge those inside the church. In other words, you have to make distinctions, make decisions about those who are in the family of God. And there are a lot of people in our modern world who will say, I'm a Christian, but not live like it. And so this, I think I've heard this question a few times, and just to clarify, um, this is primarily about those who are in your family of faith. So in modern America, a, a huge percentage of people would claim to be Christian, but they would never go to church, never read the Bible, don't know anything about God or Jesus but they culturally were kind of raised as Christian. It's not our job to be the police and to go to every single person and determine whether they're a Christian or not. But within this community, we need to protect the witness of the church. This is sort of our jurisdiction. It's our responsibility. And so there, if, you have, if you're close to someone in the church, if you know someone, it's your job sometimes to speak into their life and to confront their sin in love to help them to grow and to correct a bad pattern. So that's what we saw in chapter 5, a lot of big topics. And Paul now brings up a different and a seemingly unrelated topic, and he wants to deal with this as well. But I think the connection between chapter 5 and chapter 6 is that in both of them, Paul is dealing with certain issues that he's sort of shocked and outraged that the church in Corinth is dealing with. So he's coming to bring correction and, and to set right what is wrong in the church. And so we see here the topic is really one of conflict or disagreement in the church. Ken Ken Sandy talks about how the conflict in the church, conflict in our lives, is something that should be stewarded. If God's in control, then he's in control even of the conflicts that arise in your life. And so when some sort of division happens in your life or you have a relational conflict, you should see that as a chance to love the other person, to glorify God, 
It should be something to be cared for and stewarded well. And so Paul wants to talk about how we deal with conflict in this, church, in, in this chapter. So we see three commands he's giving them in this passage, three key commands. The first one is essentially don't be short-sighted. Don't be short-sighted. There's a constant danger in the Christian life of only thinking of things in terms of what's to, immediately in front of us, of thinking of the next five minutes instead of thinking of the next 50 years. But even for us as Christians, the biblically wise person will understand that the next 50 years are about as significant as the next five minutes when you think about life in terms of eternity. Christians shouldn't just be thinking of the the end of our lives in this life and how we can prepare for what's next in this life, but how we can prepare for eternity, the next 50 million years and beyond. And so Paul wants them to stop being so short-sighted and to see the big picture of who they are and who they will be in eternity. Look at verse 1. He says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? So Paul uses this word dare. It shows that he's really upset here. Essentially, he's saying, how dare you live this kind of way? How dare you take these kinds of actions? He's, he's shocked, and he has indignation over their actions. And the reason why he's upset is because they are going to law against their brothers. That, that phrase, go to law, is a technical term, and it refers to civil lawsuits. Okay, And this is super important because what Paul's saying here is he's not saying it's be, it's, it's, Christians should not go to the law if there's a crime committed against them. Right? So if there's a crime committed, uh, the, the God has given us this, the government for a purpose, and you're, you're free to go to them if a crime is committed. He's ta- but he's talking instead not about that, but about civil suits. He's talking about suing someone if they're a Christian. These are, these are minor matters. So he's not saying if someone commits a crime, say there's abuse in a family or in a church, he's not saying the right thing is to cover that up and not deal with it. Because obviously that could be used by someone who's a corrupt leader who would want to control people. No, we have to understand what he's saying here. He's saying, are you bringing something that is a civil suit, a lawsuit, in front of unbelievers? And that next phrase is so important. It gets to the focus of this section. He says, you're going before the unrighteous instead of the saints. So unrighteous, by that he means those who are not Christian, those who don't belong to God. He's saying, are you going to those who are not Christian or are you going to the saints. Saints, when you hear the word saints, don't think what the Catholic Church teaches, which is that there's a certain special class of Christians that are like super Christians. No, the word saints just means holy ones. And again and again in Scripture, the word saints refers to ordinary Christians, those who have been made holy by God's work in our lives, not by our own effort. So in other words, he's saying, why are you settling your disputes in front of non-Christians instead of Christians? So the problem here is the using, of, not just assuming each other, but it's the using of the secular law system to do it. And later in the same chapter, or same section here, he'll say that they are even defrauding each other. In verse 8 he says, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So there's conflict that's happening, it's not being resolved in the right way, and it's leading to an abuse of people in the church. Let's go on to verse 2. He says, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world. And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try civil cases? So he says, do you not know? And this is a phrase Paul's going to use again and again in this book. And what he's saying is, this is, this is something that's simple that you should be aware of. Do you, do you really not know who you are as a Christian, what you've been called to, what your role will be in eternity? Do you actually not know this? He wants them to think in terms of the long term, in terms of the end of time, in terms of what eternity will bring. And he says here that your calling as a Christian is that you will someday judge the world. This is is an amazing phrase because if we look at a lot of scripture, you'll notice that at the end of time, God is the one who judges people. God sits on his throne, people come before him to receive judgment, and he's the one who has authority to pronounce that judgment. So what is What does Paul mean that we're going to judge the world? Well, there's indications throughout Scripture that when the final judgment and rule of God happens, that the saints will play some role in that. Those who belong to Jesus will play some sort of role in that. In Daniel 7.22, 
Daniel has this vision. He says, the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. So there's a picture here of the saints, meaning God's people in some way, having the kingdom of God and, and ruling with him. Revelation 20, verse 4, it says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom, author- to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So there's some that have authority to judge in this verse, and there's some that reign with Christ. So in this final kingdom, the millennial kingdom, there's a ruling and even a judgment that is happening that in some way God's people participate in. So we get these vague hints as to what this might mean. But in other words, I think the the main point for this passage is if you look at the long term of your life, if you look at the big picture of your life, you see that God is preparing people like us, ordinary people, for something that is beyond our understanding. It is beyond estimation. He's preparing us to rule with him. And he even goes farther than that. He says in verse 3, Do you not know that we are to judge angels? Again, this is shocking. It, the, the word judge in this, both of these verses could also mean rule. So there's, there's a debate here. Is he saying that Christians are going to judge fallen angels, meaning demons, We don't see that anywhere else in Scripture. Or is he simply saying that Christians are going to rule over angels? And this is very probable because the authority and status we see in Scripture that's given to you will one day exceed that of the most powerful beings ever created. Uh, Beings that minister to God day and night, beings that have never sinned, beings that that are much more powerful and elevated than us, God's plan is actually to one day lift us up in authority even beyond them. It's an amazing, amazing truth. Revelation 3.21, again, it says, The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So what this points to is that in some way, in some sense, because we are we belong to Christ because we're in Christ. Our identity is in Him. That in some way, at the end of the age, we will have such an elevated status that we will be ruling and reigning with Christ. Again, I, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but what I can say is that's beyond our current understanding. And it shows us that our current worth is not determined by our current condition. Right, your current worth and status is determined by your future condition, by who you will one day become. Who you will one day be determines everything about how you should be yourself now. For example, the moment a child is born, when a baby is born, that child has accomplished nothing. They they have no merit, no resume, no accolades. And yet, when a baby is born into a certain family, let's let's say a royal family, when that child is born, if their, if their parents are king and queen, that child's status is immediately significant. They are immediately someone important simply because of who they were born to, because of what family they're in, right? So it's not, it's not because of what they've done, but it's because someday they will inherit a kingdom. So we put so much focus and value and emphasis on a child like that, even though they've done nothing. And you also, because of Christ Jesus, because he has claimed you as his own, because you're part of his family if you believe in him, you also are a child of the king. And that means one day you will inherit something that is beyond your wildest dreams. You have something staggering waiting for you one day in eternity. That's what we can see from a passage like this. In other words, you and the people around you are more important than you could possibly imagine. You and those around you are more important than you could possibly imagine. Imagine. C.S. Lewis has a famous quote from his very famous sermon, or sermon speech book by the name of The Weight of Glory, where he talks about how important people are around you, how important human lives are. I, I just love the I always think about this because I love the way that he says it. And he says it this way He says, It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible 
gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now met, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are in some degree helping each other to one or other of these destinations. There are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit, immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. What he's saying is simple. He's saying the people that are around you are, are becoming slowly something, and in eternity that will be revealed. Either you'll become more like God and be shaped into someone fit for his kingdom, or you'll become less like God. You'll become the opposite. These are the two ends that, that, that are in front of us. And so if you are a Christian, if you know God, if you've been changed by him, you are going to become something one day that will be incredible. So Paul's argument is simple. He's saying, if that's true of you, if you're going to one day rule the world and rule over angels, how are you not competent to judge these minor things in this temporary life? How, how could you not figure this out? Are you really not competent to this? He says in verse 4, he says, so if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? And you have these, you have these sort of trivial life matters, so why are you taking them to people that have no standing in the church? The, the, the phrase no standing, it's a strong phrase. It could be translated as those who are scorned or those who are of no account. So he's not at all here trying to say that people who are outside the church are, are worse people, right? We all know, if you believe in Jesus, you know that part of coming to Jesus is saying, I am terrible, I am sinful, I, am, I deserve nothing, and I'm falling in the grace of God. So he's not saying that. He's not saying that, that, we're, that people in church are better, but he's saying because of what God has done, you have something important, you have a role given to you that you have to fulfill. So you don't go to someone outside the church to solve these kinds of matters. You go to someone who has the spirit of God, the wisdom of God, who has the word of God to guide them. Now, there, th this means also there are a couple of options if you've been wronged. I've talked to people who have said, you know, that, person, that Christian um, guy, he wants to fraud me of, of $10,000, right? I, I've shared that kind of stuff. Okay, what do you do with that? I mean, that's a serious thing. That's a serious offense. Well, I'm not saying that you, that you don't actually sort that out with that person, but you take the right path. Now, there's a couple options, right? So one would be that you go to someone who is wise in your church. So you go to someone who is maybe older, wiser, who can help you sort that out. Maybe try to sit down with this person, have another Christian there to help you sort it out. That's one option. That'd be kind of the first tier. And I do think that if two people are open to someone helping them, that most cases could be resolved by an above-average Christian sitting down and working that through with them. Most issues we have are not that complicated. But some are, right? So maybe another step would be to bring in elders or pastors in your church, people who, who have not only wisdom but have some authority to help deal with that. Maybe it's someone in a different church and you need to get leaders from both churches together. To say, hey, we got to deal with this. This is not something that can be let ha we got be handled by a secular court. Let's let's iron this out. Let's figure this out. So if someone's defrauded you, then there also may sometimes be a time where you need to actually take an action by the church against that person. So if the church were to say, hey, look, this is what this is what clearly happened. Someone stole from someone else. Someone lied to someone else. You need to give that money back, and the person won't. Then that may be the time where the entire church gets involved or where church discipline happens. So we may take action as a church, but you don't go to a non-Christian to deal with things like this. When it comes to a civil suit, you don't bring in someone who's not a Christian. That's the idea. Look at verse 5. He says, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you who is wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? So Paul, Paul says, this is a shame. He's he is shaming them. He's saying, this is something that's worthy of you being embarrassed by. You should not be doing this. Um, and this is a big deal. If today someone says shame on you, you might not be affected. It might be kind of weird. But in, a, in an honor-shame society like this, this is a big deal. That someone of Paul's stature, his authority, is saying, you should be ashamed of yourself for what you're doing. So he asks them, 
if there's no one wise among them. Is there really no one wise among you? This makes me laugh because as we've been studying through 1 Corinthians, you may have seen this again and again, that the Corinthians thought they were very wise. Like Paul, the first couple of chapters are all Paul attacking them, saying, you're not that wise. You're not that, you're not that smart. You're actually insignificant. You're nothing. Don't forget that. And now he's saying to them, wait, you guys, you're the wise people, right? Is there no one wise among you who can solve just a minor dispute? You've got you to bring in a secular court. He's, he's sort of, I think, making fun of them a little bit. He's saying, oh, so you're not really that wise, are you? You can't solve your own disputes. There should be someone in the church wise enough to figure this out, but instead you're going to unbelievers. And he uses this language of brothers here, right? Brother against brother. This is a very serious thing. So what he's saying in this first section is clear. He's saying don't be short-sighted. You are being prepared for a role in eternity that is so significant. You're going to rule the universe under God's authority. You're going to be over angels, You've been prepared for something incredible, so don't abdicate a responsibility you have now and give it to people who are of the world. Don't do that. And I think there's a broader implication here. This passage doesn't just give us wisdom about how to deal with lawsuits. It gives us wisdom with how to deal with every kind of wisdom issue in our lives. The implication is don't hand over your responsibility as a Christian to those who don't know God. In other words, you are able to impact the lives of those around you more than you think. You are able to influence others and to help others and to change lives more than you think because you have two indispensable tools. You have the Word of God, which gives you eternal truth, and you have the Spirit of God, which gives you guidance. Romans 15, 14, Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. So I'm, I'm thankful that you, you have this knowledge and so you're able to teach each other. You're able to help each other. This is the task of a Christian. If you have the Spirit of God, you've been called to, to this eternal task, you should be competent to help each other with small issues in, their, in each other's lives. So you, you should be confident that you have some ability to help those around you. And in the reverse, you should not be seeking wisdom and help primarily from those who are not Christian. So we've talked before about the importance of if you are are dealing with something personal or or spiritual, um, you should not be going to a non-Christian counselor when you have Christians at your disposal. You should be very careful, right? There's a time to go to a trained Christian counselor, absolutely. There's a time where you can just deal with problems with the, the saints around you. But again, a Christian with God's word is much more powerful than a professional counselor without God's word. You should be careful what books you're reading what you put a lot of stock into. Are you listening and leaning heavily on those who don't know God when it comes to spiritual issues? Are you being shaped even passively and unintentionally by social media, by the movies and TV you watch? Are you allowing those to shape your values? Be very careful. Be careful about allowing the world to speak into issues that you should be listening to and learning from Christians. Sometimes, even without realizing it, we're, we're learning and letting our, our sense of life be shaped by those around us. So be careful with that. So the first command is, is simple. It's don't be short-sighted. See the big picture of who God has made you to be. The second command we see here, as, as I paraphrase it, is don't be a loser. Don't be a loser. And when I say that, I don't mean to insult you at all. I, I just mean to state what's here in the text. Look, look at verses 7 and 8. He says, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So no one wants to be a loser, right? And in fact, if you're going to law, if you're going to court against someone, the entire mindset of a lawsuit is to win. That's the whole point of a lawsuit. It's to win sometimes money. Sometimes it's to win reputation. It's to vindicate yourself, right? It's to win vindication. But what Paul says here is that as soon as you enter into a situation with another Christian, where it's you versus them, you've already lost. You're already a loser. And this is so important to understand. He's saying just for going into that situation, you've already lost. He says it's already a defeat for you. He's, the language here is that he's saying you are already completely defeated or it's already an utter disaster. 
you have lost if you enter in a situation where it's you versus someone else who's a believer in Christ. Now, this is true in, in marriage, isn't it? Hopefully, if you're married, you learn this early on. I, I really hope you do, which is that you and your spouse are on the same team. You're supposed to help each other. You're supposed to, to edify each other. You're not supposed to ever see yourself in competition against your spouse. Unless it's a board game, and then all rules are off, right? <laughs> Cutthroat all the way. But it's, if you start thinking of things in terms of you looking good versus your spouse, like you looking smart, and you, the way you do that is by putting down your spouse, you've already lost. Or, or if you think of you know, your wealth in terms of you versus them, if I can spend the money, if I can use this, and they can't, well, then you've already lost. It, you're already losing if you have that kind of mindset, right? Because if you set it up in a way ever where one person wins and the other person loses, and you're on a downward spiral, it's going to destroy your relationship. In fact, it would be better in that situation for you just to lose, for you just to be taken advantage of. And this is true in relationships with Christian too. He's saying you're on the same team. So when you pit someone, pit yourself against someone in the church, you're setting yourself up to lose. There's no possible way that you win. And, and some of us need to come to grips with this. It's okay sometimes to not win the argument, to not win the situation, to not come out ahead. Sometimes you let that person win, and sometimes you let yourself suffer a loss because of it. And sometimes just moving on, just cutting your losses, is the best thing you can do. Because it's so easy to be caught in a conflict where you're, you're just digging in and saying, I have to win in some sense, and you constantly are going in this downward spiral of destruction with this other person. Jesus, Jesus talks about that. Jesus talks about that it's sometimes it's okay to be taken advantage of. In Matthew 5, 38, he says very famously, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So Jesus in this passage, he quotes from the Old Testament. This is the Lex Talionis. This is the, the law of retribution, right? So, so someone else has to pay for what they've done. So the law would be if you hit someone, they lose a tooth, you have to pay some sort of fine that is commensurate to the value of that tooth, however that's defined by the priesthood, right? So you have to make up for what you have done. But Jesus says, essentially, there's a time where somebody insults you and mistreats you where you move away or where you restore the relationship. So when he says someone strikes you on the, on the cheek, he's not saying someone's trying to harm you physically, right? A slap on the cheek would not be damaging. It was, a, it was an insult. So he's saying someone insults you, someone, someone hurts your reputation, someone mistreats you, and yet you turn to restore that relationship. There's a time to look, overlook the wrong. And what we see in this passage is it's actually better to be the victim sometimes than the victimizer. I would say it's always better to be the person who is wrong than the person who has done something wrong against somebody else. And so we view life in that way. We understand that the greatest harms are our own sin. And so we'd rather take a wrong than wrong somebody else. So don't be a loser. Don't be a loser. Be careful to ever get into a dispute with someone, especially someone who's part of your family or church family, that sets you up to make one person win and one person lose. And so we come to the third command he gives in this passage, which is, don't live like you're poor. Don't live like you're poor. Verse 9, he says, do you not, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So here he's saying he wants to put them in the proper mindset. And what he's saying here is you're either living for, for your kingdom or for God's kingdom. You're either living to glorify yourself, to lift up yourself, or you're living for God's eternal kingdom. If you're living for your kingdom, then you can have everything you want. But when you die, it will be all gone. There will be nothing left for you. But if you live for God's kingdom, then even if you have nothing in this life, you will have everything in the next life. You will inherit something of infinite value. So this changes how we view our lives, right? In other words, there are those who will lose everything when they die, and this means that they have a scarcity mindset. They'll, they'll, they are truly destitute. They are heading towards nothing, and so they have to live for right now. 
But God's people have an incredible promise that, that we actually are going to receive everything when we die. And nothing in this life is going to ultimately matter when we receive that et- eternal kingdom that we're made to inherit. And so, Paul, so Paul says clearly here that those who live in their sin are not going to inherit this kingdom. They're living in a way for the now, for themselves. And so he offers this list of sins, and it's, it's not a comprehensive list of sins. Paul does lists of sins like this very often in his writings. But there are certain things that are on his heart, maybe specifically because of who the Corinthians are. And so he brings up all these issues. He says first, the sexually immoral. We've seen a lot about this, and we'll see a lot more about that term in following verses. But it, this is just a catch-all phrase for those who engage in various kinds of sexual sin. So the sexually immoral, the idolaters, those are those who worship false gods, who, who turn earthly temporary things into eternal things, who lift up the stuff of this life above God himself. Then there are the adulterers, those who are unfaithful in marriage. They says, nor men who practice homosexuality. This is actually two different terms. And like I said, we'll deal with that extensively next Sunday. Then he says, the thieves, those who steal in secret. The greedy, those are those who want from others and don't care how much it hurts them if they get it. There's the swindlers, those who forcibly steal from others. Those who will use their power to coerce things from other people. And he says, all of these will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a strong warning here. Right? If you're living your life for those things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You are headed towards a disaster. There's nothing for you after this life except for pain and suffering. But then this is followed by some of the most amazing words in all of Scripture in verses, uh, verse 11. I love this. Some of the most beautiful, hope-filled words in all the Bible are right here. He says, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I love that. He says, such were some of you. You used to fit into these categories. Maybe you still do. Maybe you're here and you still do. You say, I don't love God. I love those things. I live for those things. But he's saying here that someone who was one of those things, was one of those people, can become something different. You can be transformed. And you're, you, you used to be that, but you're not it anymore. Not because you've done something great. Not because you figured your life out. Not because you're now perfect and sinless. But because three things have changed you. Three things he lists here. And in Greek, he repeats the word but three times. Right? It's, very, it's a very emphatic way of saying this. And these words show different aspects of what it means to be saved by Jesus. He says, but you were washed. You've been cleansed of your sins. This is what baptism symbolizes, that we've come to God in faith and he's washed us, he's cleansed us of the unclean things that we've done. He's made us into something new. Hebrews 10, 21 says, we have a great high priest over the house of God, so let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We can come before God because we've been cleansed by him. He says, you were washed. He says, you were sanctified. What that means is you were made holy. You've been set apart for a special purpose. You've been made into someone new. You've been given the status of saint. You are not the person that you used to be because of an act of God. He says, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. The word justified means that a legal declaration has been made on your account, that your status Your criminal record before God has been washed clean. You're no longer condemned for the things that you've done. It's not a declaration that everything you do now is right. That's not what he's saying, but that God always views you as perfect. You're always accepted before the judge. And on that final day, you will not receive condemnation. You will receive an eternal inheritance. So this is something that is available for any person who would believe in Jesus. Like I said, maybe you you still would say, I find myself in that list of sins. I know I don't, I don't live for God. I don't love him. But there's, there's, it's not just that we have to try harder or do better. God is calling us to trust in Jesus and to find forgiveness in him. Because the reason why we can have a hope for the future is because Jesus Christ has done everything for us. The reason why we can be guaranteed that we have been cleansed and made new and forgiven eternally The reason why we have this inheritance awaiting for us is because Jesus Christ gave up everything to come and rescue us. 
He was eternally God, and yet he gave up his glorious existence. He gave up comfort and wealth. He gave up all the good things that he had to come and to be with us and to die for us. 2 Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. He set aside everything that he had so that we could have access to it, so that we could have this inheritance someday. So the command here is, is a simple one, right? Don't have a lawsuit against a brother or sister in Christ. But the implications are staggering. They're incredible. The why behind this command changes everything. And it's because you are eternally significant in God's plan. If he's called you and rescued you, and he's preparing you for something that is beyond your imagination. It's because you have a new status in Jesus Christ. So let's live in a generous way. Let's live in a way where sometimes we're even okay with someone mistreating us or taking advantage of us because our eternal status and our eternal wealth is secure in Jesus. Have a a long-term mindset. Remember that God has made you rich in Jesus Christ. And so be secure in that. Let's pray together.